Welcome to the FNO InsureTech Podcast, a place where movers and shakers from all points within the insurance ecosystem gather and discuss all things InsureTech. We talk about how technology and innovation are affecting and driving change in the industry. Here are your hosts, Lee Boyd and Rob Beller. Hey, podcast world, you'll never believe this. After yep. tremendous work, blood, sweat, and tears, trying and trying, trying, begging, arm twisting, threatening, we got her. Yep. We got her. We got her. Big deal. We 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 got her back again. The one, the only, Caitlin Johnson is here today with us. And Lee and I would like to say it's because of us, right? Right. 100%. Or Alicia, our intrepid content producer, would like to say it's because of her. Yeah. But it's not. You know why it is that Caitlin's with us today, don't you? I mean, I think I do. Well, tell us. Because she's about to have a baby. That's exactly correct. We have a tradition on the FNO and SureTech podcast, and that is if Caitlin Johnson's going to be on, she's about to give birth. That's right. We're part of the checklist, like get crib, get uh-huh. on FNO and uh-huh. have have baby. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. And we, we appreciate FNO that. FNO and Tech podcast. That's right. We appreciate that. We appreciate her, her um, you know, checklist and adding us to that. That's very kind of her. So who is this Caitlin Johnson that we're so excited about anyways? Caitlin Johnson is a huge deal, right? She's a huge deal. She's at American Family Ventures. And she knows the ins and outs of the InsurTech world. She's a investor, right? She interviews and she talks to these companies all day, every day. She knows where trends are. She's a big deal, big deal. And and as you all know, AmFam Ventures, preeminent, one of the most successful. I don't know how they've done. I don't know about the dollars, but I know as far as hitting home runs, they have an amazing track record, and Caitlin is a managing director there. Uh, Dan Reed and Caitlin and their team ha- uh, do amazing work yeah. um, with a, a list of successes that will rival anybody's. And so to have somebody of Caitlin's caliber on to talk about current state of affairs, what the craziness in financial markets is doing, and even some advice even a little bit of tidbit for you of, of advice for you and sure techies out there who are looking to do some pitching. She has some advice, some do's and don'ts. Yep. We're not going to tell you where it is in the podcast, but you got to listen for it. Yeah. You got to listen from the beginning to end. Cause it's yes. in there. It's you in have there. to listen every minute. No fast forward. No, totally okay. worth it. Totally worth it. Full of great information. So, um, we 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 do want you to know also that we advocated that the baby's name, which is a girl this time, should be Little Robbie. Yeah, I I don't think she was going. for Not it, even though. for a second. She didn't give it <laughs> a even, second thought. Didn't even. She just flat out said absolutely not. So that's, that's a terrible not, idea. Not no. out. So no. Well, she didn't leave me hanging. No, she's she's straightforward. She's a straight shooter. No, yeah. Rob. Last time she she idea. said they'd take it on advisement, but. Mm-hmm. Not yeah. this time. She's not. No, she doesn't have to be nice anymore. She knows. Okay, I do have a. I do have a girl Robbie story though. That you do. I'll, we'll tell next time. Yeah, next time on our next okay. podcast. I'm excited to hear that. So uh, enough of our jibber jabber, which we all know is the only reason that you fast <laughs> forward through this podcast because once you get to the interview, that's where the good stuff is. That's right. And uh, um, without further ado, let's get to once again. One of our favorites. I think a five-timer. Yeah, smoking jacket. Smoking jacket. Uh, Caitlin Johnson, Harvard grad, managing director, American Family Ventures. Hey, everybody. We're here with, I don't even know how many times we've had (laughs) Caitlin Johnson on. I think she's a host on our show. I think so. 
Yeah. Quite probably. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're going to add your, your little uh, head figurine to our other ones Love as, sorry. as, I'm as sorry. a host of FNO and SureTech, one of our, mm-hmm. one of our favorite guests. And as soon as we get our five timer smoking jacket made that has, you know, the nice embroidered logo on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's coming out to you. Yeah. I cannot promise. wait. I already got the smoking slippers. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Well, do you have a color preference? You know, a nice maroon, I feel like. Oh, is always- that would be nice. Ooh, yeah. Like a smoky maroon. Yeah. That's right. That, yeah. We need to make, would, make a note of that. That, that right. would be good. So, go. so for those of you who don't know, you might think that Caitlin only joins us when she's about to have a baby. <laughs> right. And you would be kind of correct if you thought that, rightly. You would be. However, yeah. that's not entirely the case. But tell us the story, Caitlin. What's going on? What's what's well, your current state? Yeah, this time's not nearly as exciting as last time, Rob, because we've got a good five weeks before um, Little Miss is scheduled to arrive. But last time, I think we were down to the wire. I think it was like the week of my due date or something it like was. that. that we were it really was. Ready. It was. And um, I know our audience is going to be so disappointed. Yeah. Yeah. So so small chance that uh, we have a disruption this go round, but you never know. No, no, we, we can't do that for a few more weeks. But uh, <laughs> right. so we could spend our time today talking about being pregnant for the second time. How, how, how has it been the second time? Any different than the first? Well, we're not in like the center of COVID. So that was like a weird dynamic last time. But yeah. no, just like this time, I actually forget I'm pregnant like 99% of the time. I think it's like the classic second kid right. thing. Yeah. You're so busy with the first, you right. got the job. Now it's like old news, like done this before, been there, done that. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, it's um. so thankfully I'm very blessed. This has been uneventful of a pregnancy. So that's uh. That's always good. That's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. And just so that, because we've, we've kind of skipped over who you are and what you do. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a step back. Yeah. Caitlin Johnson, still with AmFam Ventures, yeah. right? Right. Yeah. So That's catch great. us up. Catch us up. Yeah. Where are you? What's your job? What's changed? Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad because the viewers are probably yeah. like, thank God this isn't the OBGYN podcast. <laughs> 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 yeah. we. Um, I'm a managing director at AmFam Ventures. We're an early stage fund that's focused on everything from incubation to early growth rounds in things that impact the future of insurance. So it's things that are going to be squarely insure tech, both either on like the carrier side or the like enabling technology that allow insurance companies to operate like claims tech, things like that. And then like we do a lot of fintech, real estate, prop tech stuff. Um, so yeah, it's it's a, an exciting world and, and thematic focus for us. I mean, I, I geek out over it and things are going really well. We're actively raising our fourth fund at the moment. Wow. And, um, yeah. And that's been, that's been going really nice. So I think there will be a nice step up in, in fund size that we'll get to announce um, hopefully within the, the next couple months here. In the world that we live in today, and we'll talk about how crazy yeah. things are in the financial world yeah. today, but you would expect people to say, hey, we're in the middle of raising our fourth round and it's a it's a bloodbath out there. Yeah. But you just said, hey, we're in the middle of raising our fourth round and it's going well. Yeah. Is that a function of the success and the track record that you guys have? What, what, what do you attribute that to? Yeah, I don't want to like toot our own horns here too much, but I think it is a fact that we've built something that really does resonate and provide value in the corners of the world that we're playing. And so um, just the partners that we've brought around the table have found tremendous value in our re-upping. And then we're we're expanding the, the and bringing on new partners this go around because we've proven out that the value prop works in bringing kind of insurance investors into our fund and carrier invest investors and in ecosystem, I should say, participants, and marrying that with the opportunity to get early looks at some promising technology that's getting off the ground in a sector that they really care about. And the entrepreneurs love it because they have almost um, like an, an embedded network that they get from day one that we roll on the cap table. And honestly, even um, 
before they get on the cap table, the, there's companies we, that we never end up investing in, but will add tremendous value to. So I think it's just in building out that whole ecosystem and that whole vision, it really has resonated with folks in a, in a deep and meaningful way. That's cool. I want to talk for a few minutes about how much things have changed, but I don't want to leave the focus on AmFam Ventures for a minute. Yeah. If you look at your guys' exits, it's like, wow. I mean, <laughs> it's about your team, right? Yeah. Or do you think your focus is just right? What do you attribute that success to? Yeah, I think it was a lot of a, a, of the perfect storm, Rob. So like we hit insurance very early in its infancy. I would still argue we're in the infancy in the early innings of the insure tech investment cycle, but like we were there functionally like day zero, right? Getting the fund off the ground. I think it was like us in USAA that had funds. So um, early, early entrance onto the scene with a strong belief that this sector in this corner of the sphere would take off. And then yeah, I think it's just been like us leveling up over time and we've just been around the block enough. And and we honestly, the other huge thing is in bringing LPs to the table that are truly deep, that have deep expertise because they are either carriers, brokers themselves or people, executives or um, folks that impact the ecosystem in some manner. We're able to leverage their knowledge base as well when we're doing diligence and that helps tremendously. So I think it's just, it's access, it's us and our, like what we've seen in our judgment and it's um, having kind of established ourselves early on in the, in the trajectory of this space. Uh, only because I have to shamelessly do this. It's not Dan Reed, is it? Oh, I mean, it's definitely Dan Reed, right? I mean, like, who doesn't love that guy, right? I totally love Dan Reed. Baseball player. Yeah. Venture capitalist. Absolutely. Two ideas that always run together. I know. I know. It's great. He's always hit home runs in every career he's been in. Isn't that fun? You get to say that. Look yeah. at that. It's a home yeah. run hitter. I, yeah. I, yeah. I'm on your website. There's some home runs on here. There's, some, right. there's, yeah. some, there's some doubles. I, I don't see the strikeouts on here. I bet there's a few of those yeah. too. <laughs> they don't I'm advertise sure We have those. our fair share of strikeouts. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, if, if you can't have a win if you don't strike out. Right. Yeah. Every once in a while. That's right. So I wanted to ask about the actual intro techs that are out there now. You know, you've been at this for a long time. What are you seeing? Are insured techs creating new things, new processes, new things that need to be in the insured tech ecosystem, or is it just a reinvention of the same old thing? There are material advancements that have been happening. I think, you know, when you just look at the APIification that's been happening in this industry, you can attribute a lot of that to the insure techs. And um, I just think the rapid speed at which technology is being ingested is has been really positive. To be honest, like when we started hitting and heading into COVID territories back in 2020, there was like a almost like a rush to to say, okay, we need to prioritize internally from, from the carrier side of things, like the digitization of a lot of processes, because now we're having this work from home and functionally perpetuity. We don't know when folks are going to be back in the office. And it really did force the hand and I think force some of the adoption curve of a lot of these technologies that people would have said, oh, this makes a lot of sense, but it's probably on a five to 10 year adoption cycle. Um, so yeah, I, I actually do feel like there's been material material movements across kind of the claims ecosystem across. Yeah. Yeah. Rob, I see you point, <laughs> pointing on that one. And um, even internally as to how people are thinking about building out and their policy admin systems and how different systems internally are going to be working together. So I've seen it and experienced it. And I know our carrier partners have as well. We're always amazed by what's happening, what's going on. You have crazy, niche little companies like Hazard Hub, yeah. who basically could tell you where any fire hydrant is in the country as an insure tech. And then you have, you know, big monster ones like, you know, Hippo, that's right. an insurance company. Right. And are you seeing things get narrower? Are they getting more... Uh, focused into certain areas mm -hmm. or, or are you seeing new stuff just and new ideas continue to pop up all over the place? 
Oh, that's a, that's a really good question. You know, I think that we've seen uh, sensationalism in different waves, in different categories and sectors right now. So um, an example of that is, you know, everybody's talking about embedded insurance right now for the past like 12 months. And that's not a new concept. We've been investing against that since 2015, but Angela Strain over at Andreessen like coined the term embedded. We had been calling it uh, something different internally. And, um, and now it's like a blaze. Everybody is dropping the word embedded in (laughs) all of their decks. Um, and so you really have to sift through a lot of, of stuff out there because it's, it is the hot new buzzword, but like I've seen an uptick in claims tech that's been coming through as of late. Like everybody seems to be like that. That is definitely on the rise. Um, So I'd say it comes in fits and spurts. But the things that have been consistent have been trying to figure out new ways of delivering insurance products in a cost effective manner and beating out the incumbents. And so we're turning the corner and the tides on the InsureTech 1.0s that have been out in the market. And we're looking towards, you know, the branches who I know you guys recently had them on, on your podcast yeah. um, and they just announced a whopper of a round at a, at a unicorn. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. At a unicorn valuation, which is fantastic. Um, and the hope there would be that, you know, they have, their cost to acquire a customer is best in class. Their unit economics look really good. Their loss ratios um, and curves are, are are on track and tracking nicely for an ins- something in the insure tech class. And so, because of that, um, it's building. And and sorry, I failed to mention their growth has just been sensational. And so. Y- they're proving out a little bit that at first the initial thesis was, okay, we'll grow more slowly, but, um, so the cost will be a little bit slower of growth, not like horrible growth, but just not like, you know, lemonade or hippo style growth, but we're going to be doing so while we have the right insurance fundamentals in place to Mm -hmm. prove to the market, to prove to the analysts that have lost faith in this class, or the thought was analysts would at some point in the future lose faith in the class because the early wave was not focused on insurance fundamentals. Mm -hmm. And so the branches of the world have been saying, no, no, like we've built that into our model and we'll be a healthy, sustainable business when we, when we're at scale. And Hopefully that'll resurrect faith in the public markets outlook on kind of the insure techs of the world. Which is and if they're able to pull that off. Yeah. No, it's not great right now. You're absolutely right. Yeah. We have people on this podcast, full disclosure, who yeah. own hippo stock. Uh, <laughs> That's, let's just say that, I, I watch uh, it fairly often. I watch it yeah. fairly often. But yeah, I, and I, I think that's it. I mean, it, is that the reason? Is it because we're looking at a different wave, branch coming in as a different wave, somebody who is focused on the fundamentals, where the early ones were more about uh, getting to market early, getting to market fast, getting out there, branches more methodical in their in their process? Is that it? Yeah. I mean, so we talked with Steve, gosh, uh, I feel like we did our first investment in them back in 2019. And that, that was his mantra way back when was, Hey, you know, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to replicate lemonade or hippo or any of these other guys. I'm trying to be my own beast, which is, um, maybe we sacrifice growth a little bit, um, with, ins- but like, we definitely make sure we have insurance fundamentals and, and it turns out he hasn't had to sacrifice growth. He has right. scaled crazy, crazy fast and it, like faster than, than lemonade and, and hip over able to pull off. So, um, he's been able to do so really in the last like 18 to 24 months has been, has been their, their real upswing. Um, and he's been able to pull that off really well while keeping like everything else from a loss ratio and and things like best in class functionally. Can you attribute some of that to Steve? And I know Steve as co-founder as well. Yeah. But to, to, he's an insurance guy. He is. Right. And 100%, that's where he came from. That's what he's done with his career and he understands it. And that, you know, one of the interesting things that has always gotten to Lee and I, and I'm sure to you as well and, and, and your team is, is that, you know, a lot of times you have people coming into the insurance and <laughs> pro, I'm sure certainly into insure tech yeah. who don't know the fundamentals of insurance. Yes. Do you think that that's a key factor here? 
We talk about this all the time. And if you asked me this question two years ago, I would have said, I don't know, jury's still out. And I feel like I've really um, gotten a better sense of that over time in that um, in the early innings of this, when people, when it was revolutionary and just novel to be working on something in insure tech. Yeah. I feel like you could have had any background to be able to pull that off because people were saying, Oh, interesting. You have a thesis that insurance can be disrupted, but that's like table stakes. Like everybody's like, duh, insurance can be disrupted now. And so you need to have like smart thoughts <laughs> on how to execute that disruption. And I feel like that requires you to be a student of the space. And so I actually do think that we're going to start seeing either people coming out of the the ones of InsureTax who have seen it and have said, ah, oh, we can make this better or we know where it's gone awry. But the beautiful thing about Steve and like, no offense, Steve, if you're listening, um, he's such a super nerd about like about insurance. It's so fantastic. I mean, like grew up at Nationwide. That dude can tell you like the founding story of like Nationwide. And like he just he's a deep, thoughtful guy and has taken the time to really understand the evolution of the space that got us to where we're at today. And I think when you understand something at that deep of a fundamental level, you can understand why things are work well or what should be changed and why things have failed. And he poured all of that knowledge into his thesis for branch. And I think that's why you're seeing them be able to pull off a pretty incredible fundraise during a very tumultuous time in the market. Yeah, I mean, let's talk a little bit about raising funds in this market. There is a yeah. lot going on as we so were, much. you know, we're just on a podcast. All right, we're on the podcast now. The Fed just announced that they're going to raise interest rates again. Stocks yeah. are up, they're down, they're all over the place. The public is looking at insured tech and saying, hey, we're not so sure about this. Uh, just with the, with, with the couple I'm looking at. Yeah. Uh, I guess it's much more difficult to raise money now than it was two years ago. Yeah. Well, the, the word is, how's it different? Well, I think, well, like, let's, to answer that, let's step back and look at the broad market in general. We've had over the last two years, so much inflow of capital in the venture capital space in general, not just in sure tech. And I mean, this is just, people have been raising funds because what happens is when the public markets are doing well, um, the surplus that happens from investments made in the public market flow into then the private markets. And so, private equity becomes very well capitalized. And when private equity becomes capitalized, you started, we started to see like the tigers, the Kotus, these mega funds just raise mega dollars and start deploying them um, at rapid rates, like basically doing a 24 hour turnaround diligence like cycle, which is wild. Wow. And so it threw everything. It totally changed the rules and, and the game a little bit in, in how venture was getting funded. And I think we're starting to see some of the repercussions of that, like early burnouts, companies um, just becoming very undisciplined with the cash that they raised because they thought, oh, well, it's a commodity. I'm I can, I raised this before I'll be able to raise it again. And it's the really smart founders who took, who took the capital at probably not super dilutive terms since they were getting great valuations. And they said, let's save this for a rainy day and, and be really smart stewards of that money. So we're seeing like, not, it's not going to be a flame out for everybody, but it's, I think for the people that have been more undisciplined, it's, it's going to start, um, the reckoning day is going to start coming and we're going to start seeing down rounds or flat rounds, um, because the, valuation step-ups were just tremendous without having really been earned. Um, so now fast forward to where we're at today, where the public markets aren't doing so hot. So you're starting to see a tightening. You're starting to see the valuations come back down. And there's really been this like freeze pattern for series C rounds and beyond, even like late, yeah, really series C and like late stage rounds because private investors are trying to key off of what's going on in the public sphere. And so there's this like bit of a lag where folks are like, I don't know, like we, we don't have to deploy. Let's just sit on the dollars and see how things pan out. So that's what's happening a little bit across the markets. They feel a bit frozen right now in the later stages. And um, earlier stages, you're star just starting to see some of the valuations be impacted. Although I do think they're not going to fully re 
revert to kind of where we were. I think we are still going to be seeing a bit of an uptick from um, where we've historically seen seeds, pre-seeds, Series A kind of done at. But now to talk about InsureTech specifically, you take this broad um, impact of what's been going on in the markets and kind of the current environment, and you layer on to that, that the InsureTechs that have exited and are now in the public spotlight have been severely underperforming and really just kind of um, not, not living up to uh, investors and analysts' hopes and dreams in terms of performance. I think that in terms of, um, and I hate to say this, but I think that like they're, they're in an even worse spot than your average run of the mill, like public company right now, just because of the negative sentiment that's surrounding their performance. And so the asset class as a whole has a, has a bit of work to do to get back into the good graces of the analysts and kind of prove out. And I think our hope, at least at AFV, is that um, companies like Branch and folks in their ilk are going to be able to step up in a big and meaningful way and, and redeem some, some of the, the faith in, in the class. You guys invest, I don't want to say pillar to post because I know how disciplined you are. Yeah. But but you're in like you said you're in claims tech you you guys are in hover yeah which is you know one of the great success stories of insure tech yeah but you're also in branch which is I, I think they're probably an MGA but they're basically yeah. a, car- a carrier yeah um, and and everything in between talk a little bit about your process how, how do you do that how do you on the surface it seems like you're all over the place you guys are in wise i know that's one of your yeah. favorite little t- niche crazy companies love this talk it's, about that yeah so it really goes back to this thesis of things that impact the future of insurance. And we do, we are very disciplined. We often will argue in investment committees around, hey, is this, are we telling ourselves a story here? Or is this actual game changing technology that can impact the insurance ecosystem, whether it be the, uh, the carriers themselves or the, the sectors that they are, you know, that they play in um, and the markets that impact them. And so, that makes it, I think is what's really interesting is that we're able to deliver obvious value, but also non-obvious value for things that could transform um, the space in a real meaningful way in the future, whether it's through interesting data sets that kind of roll off some of the companies, or if it's through technology, like I know you had just called out Hover, which, you know, from an exterior standpoint, being able to help um, it, it's funny because <laughs> Hover's a bit of a, of a hedge in the sense that when insure tax are getting beat up in the market because claims are at all times high, Hover's having a really good quarter. <laughs> so, yeah, they're happy. <laughs> it's, right. a, it's a nice hedge just from uh, that, that, that standpoint. So yeah, so that I think, you know, that's what makes this job so fun and AmFam so fun to, to be at is that we have, um, this mandate that I think is really intriguing. Let's talk about, it seems like one of the very, very hot things in the world yeah. has been payments. Yes. You, you guys are, you, you were in one. We were in and, one. Which is kind of a super solid, important payment yes. company. Are you still, do you still feel strongly about payments? Yeah, we do. You know, what's so funny. We haven't done a ton lately um, in payments, but yes, like One Inc. was a great outcome and um, we're super proud of what they've been able to build and, and establish and how it's rippled through the industry and, and had kind of rapid adoption. And so I think, you know, as we, we do look to see... Um, this space and and feel like there's more ways in which it can continue to mature, but we haven't been deploying as much against that thesis in, in recent months. And I also want to ask you a question about embedded. Yeah. So for those of us who aren't too smart, because as you know, if you ever (laughs) listen to the podcast, I'm not the smart one. That's Lee. You're the pretty one. Well, we we, we, we all all have a role. (laughs) I mean, you know, we know our place. We know our place. You said that embedded is so hot for the last 12 yeah. months. So, so explain what embedded is and why it's hot. Yeah. So the, the concept of embedded is that you can functionally be delivered or sh- in a shopping mode for an insurance product when you never realized that you 
needed an insurance product. And so you could be checking out for um, an event like a concert, or you could be checking out for a piece of jewelry, or you could be checking out for XYZ product. And during that checkout process, embedded in that process will be the opportunity to purchase an, an insurance product. And so we're seeing a whole bunch of um, companies that are looking to to tackle this space. So I'm, I'm thinking of one that Lightspeed did earlier this spring, which is a company called Cover. And and what I'm saying, what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of product innovation going on because what Cover is doing is they're saying, hey, you know when you go to buy a piece of clothing, but it says final sale or no returns. And as a consumer, it's a little off putting. You're like, Oh, do I want to take the gamble? Especially if it's a higher price product, you're like, I don't know if I want to be out 150 on something that might not fit. And so what covers is cover is saying is, Oh, we'll give you a, you can buy a, they're not calling it insurance. It's more of like a warranty esque product, but Mm -hmm. it allows you to buy and purchase um, protection that will allow you to return it and cover will take on that risk. And so there's just interesting um, new products being surfaced to alleviate and mollify some of the pain points that consumers have experienced over the years. So So it's really, it's putting insurance even in places where it's never existed before. Mm -hmm. With the products, like, so we're seeing a new, new wave of products that have never existed, new class of products. Um, And we're, we're also seeing older products like auto insurance or home insurance be embedded in certain checkout flows where they hadn't existed as seamlessly before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I always thought about that one. You know, we, yeah. we bought a, a, a new car recently and I thought whenever I'm buying my new car, wouldn't it be nice if I could just buy the insurance, you know, for the rest of the year or whatever, whenever right. I'm checking out, right. Maybe yeah. X amount more, my car is <laughs> insured for as long as I have it. I think that would be a really neat sample of embedded insurance. Right. I think that's really cool. And the, like, as we're starting to see it, like, I mean, decade or two ago, you couldn't buy a car online. And now with like Carvana and these car vending machine companies, you can. And uh, I think it makes a lot of sense to have an insurance flow as part of that. Who underwrites these crazy things like cover? I mean, are they underwritten by a legitimate big carrier who's just looking to expand their business? Yeah, sometimes they are. Um, I like I can't speak to covers case and exactly okay. who what what right. they're doing, but um, they in not being a physical insurance product, right? They are they don't have to play necessarily by the same rules, so they can kind of um, if you're more in like the warranty space or guarantee mm-hmm. space, you don't mm-hmm. have to have all of the layers that an insurance carrier has to have to be able mm-hmm. to deliver a product to consumers. So. Mm-hmm. That's really nice. There's no like rate filings or things like that. They are literally using data and AI and functionally self-insuring themselves on the back end. Um, so it's just making sure that that their underwriting is good and that their dynamic pricing model works well to make sure that they're not uh, taking loss after loss after loss and snowballs. So yeah, I think there's like really cool models that are emerging that you don't have to necessarily be be an insurer to pull off. Whenever they're doing that, I assume they don't, if, if you're not an actual insurance company and it's more of a warranty product, you, you probably don't have to play by the same rules on claims. Exactly. Like the other day, yeah. my daughter, we bought, we bought a soccer ball and there was insurance or, you know, coverage that we could get for the soccer ball if the dog ate it. It was so complicated to file <laughs> a claim. And I thought, I don't think that they're under the same guidelines that my auto insurance is under. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, it, it's more of a... It's there. It's just a little harder to get. Yeah, that is certainly true. <laughs> that is certainly true. And that's where you, as a little bit as a consumer, need to tease out is the snake oil. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah. and should I be avoiding it? But I do, like, there are also a lot of companies trying to build a lot of products from an insurance standpoint that haven't existed before to take advantage of the embedded wave. But it's much more of a slog, right? Because, yeah. because to Rob's point, like, carriers are like, what, why do people want this? You have to kind of build the case. Um, right. and it's, it's harder for folks to take that, that swing, um, knowing that this product has never existed. And so we truly are uncertain about the demand here, but you know, some folks say, Hey, from a reinsurance, like 
standpoint, like if we can help them with paper and it doesn't take off, okay, we probably haven't lost that much time, just some internal work setting up a, a partnership. So I'm assuming that you're still uh, busy or involved with hearing pitches. Yes, is that, absolutely. Is that the case? Yeah, yeah, all is, the time. That must be fun. It's a blast. It's my favorite part of the job. Really? Why? So, because you get to listen to these like people who are dreamers and innovators, and they have just these grand visions, and it's so inspiring. Like I, I don't have a big grand idea or vision that I'm actively pursuing and kind of putting betting my career on, and um, and I just think it's it's people taking big swings to chase down these big dreams. And, um, I've always thought venture is such a privileged, uh, it's such a privilege to, to be able to hold the role that I do. Um, because I get to be around these inspiring people. I get to like, listen and talk to them every day. I get to be a consummate learner. And, um, and then at the end of the day, I'm not on the hook for implementing any of this stuff. Of the entrepreneurs are. So it's right. like, I can just sit here and be a judge and a pine on ideas and not have to implement. I don't know in what world that's a job, but I will take it. So yeah, I love it. That's part that's of great. why my my son, who's who's in a, a startup in an entirely different industry, uh, who's venture funded, just yeah. finished their C round. Oh, and wow. um Congrats. yeah, yeah. And um uh that's one of the problems that he has with, with VCs, right? Is that wait a minute, I'm doing all the work, yes. right? And 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 they're just bringing them under the table. But the but I I say to him, the sad truth is is you there would be no table if they weren't at your table. Yeah. So shut right. up. Yeah. And I stand up for you guys. <laughs> well, thank you. But also, your son's argument does. <laughs> A little bit of water. It's yeah. like I said, it's a really privileged position. Um, and we're li- really lucky. And you're right. If we weren't bringing the dollars to the table and dreaming alongside of these guys, it would make it a lot harder to, for them well, to get stuff off the ground. Is it hard? And I just want to ask you, I mean, because I, I don't know how many pitches you hear in a year, but I'm guessing it's probably triple digits. Yeah. And, and that so, sense. I mean, how in the world do you sort through <laughs> because you, the opportunity you have enormous opportunity, uh, particularly a high profile um, organization like yours, tons of tons of people want to pitch to you. Tons of people want your investment. Mm-hmm. I'm guessing it's like getting into Harvard. Not that you would know anything about getting into Harvard, Caitlin Johnson. We'll just skip over that. But but it's a very small percentage that mm-hmm. are chosen. How do you do that? How do you not get swept up in the excitement and the enthusiasm? I mean, the truth is you do like early, especially early in your career, you're like thinking everything is interesting. And then you've heard enough of the same types of pitches enough to know, oh, that's fraught because of X, Y, Z. And so you start to hone your judgment. And when you're seven, eight years into this thing, like I am hearing pitches, you kind of have built a little bit of a proclivity to certain types of stories that you like to hear. And Mm -hmm. um, you build definite biases against other types of stories. And so Mm -hmm. um, it's through a set of experiences, seeing how these things have played out in the past. But it's why this is a a bit of an apprenticeship type of an industry because you have to see so much to start understanding what's going to work and why, um, and be willing to dream alongside folks and kind of take flyers. So it is, it's definitely judgment honed over time. It must, it must amaze you sometimes when you've seen somebody and you've, because of your experience and know-how hmm. you've said no, and they go someplace else to an, yeah. somebody else who ends up underwriting them for a big number. Yes. And, right. Yes. And, and, it's and do, you, sometimes, do, but- do you stay up at night saying, what did I miss? Or I mean, what did they see? Are they crazy? <laughs> they I, mean, how do you- I used to, but like, that is one way to give yourself ulcers and to die really early because, <laughs> because <laughs> you're going to miss, you're going to, you're going to say no to companies that are going to go on and, and prove you wrong. And I love it when they prove me wrong. And I love when I get to go back to them and be like, 
I was totally wrong here because I don't like saying no to people's dreams. It's, it's not a fun thing to do right, or a right. not right now. But right. um, so I love it when they prove me wrong. And that's my hope is that every time I say no, that that entrepreneur makes it, makes it big and comes back to me and says, ha ha, you were wrong. And I will say, yep. And I'm <laughs> eating humble pie right now. Um, oh, yeah. So yeah, so definitely. But then there are other times where it's like a real head scratcher and you're like, huh, all right, well, we'll see. Maybe I did miss something. And, th- and then it is, um, it throws you into a bit of a, a loop of, hey, again, because it's all about honing judgment. It's, well, let's see how this plays out. Because if we did miss something fundamentally, what was the lesson that we learned out of it so that we don't make that mistake next time? And sure. I think it is all about playing Monday morning quarterback to understand um, and, and basically doing postmortems to understand where you, you went awry and where you can become better as an investor, but yeah, the, it's, it's really easy to get down that rabbit hole and it's a, it's a, like, it's a total uh, quicksand. <laughs> Once you get in it, it's, it just takes you down to say the shoulda, coulda, woulda game, because there's just, to be honest, a lot of luck. There's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that goes into this. But there's all, also a lot of luck. And I just feel like sometimes people underplay that element of luck. So Okay, so then we're going to close with something out there for all the entrepreneurs who are getting ready to pitch, who have pitched, yeah. who are thinking about pitching. Give your KJ a couple of important points that you want to that you would like everybody to know before they come in and pitch to somebody like you guys. Yes. Okay. First of all, have a very clear and concise answer to what the problem is you're solving and why that's a problem. Um, Delivering me pizza on a 30 second push of a button after I order it would be awesome, but probably not a true problem that that many people are willing to pay for what you would need to execute that. Um, So the acuteness of the problem needs to be severe and the market needs to be attractive and you need to have a grasp and a handle on the approach and kind of go to market. The other thing is do not please do not overstate your market size. It is one of the most discrediting things that I think entrepreneurs can do in a pitch is um, say, well, the total spend in this sector is 25 billion. So it's really big. And it's like, yeah, but what is the spend attributable to your solution? Is that really big? And I think that's where uh, some folks misstep. Um, So basically, do that homework and, and do it well so you so that you don't hit that roadblock. Um, and then it's just really, you know, the um, to be an entrepreneur, you have to have thick skin and you're going to hear no a lot, um, but you're also going to hear yes. And so just keep chasing those yeses. Don't let yourself get down. Um, and like I said, it's, it's a bit of luck and it's um, being at the right time at the right place with the right person to say yes. Um, it's, it's that perfect storm. And so those are hard to come by, but so that's why you got to knock on a lot of doors. Those how are about, great. How about wear a really cool outfit that day? Also, yes. If you bring me a smoking jacket, that would be awesome. <laughs> okay, that Lee. Help. okay, Lee. We're, Lee, we're this close to getting funded now. Okay, <laughs> we're so close. All we need, we're so close. All we need is an Keys idea. The kingdom. <laughs> need a, need an idea and something to be passionate about. And, oh, and, a, and, and do an you think we could get funding jacket. for the podcast? Maybe um, um, only we knew somebody. <laughs> I don't know. We're, the spend is not very. We're, we're big. approaching. We we're go. approaching four years into this, and no one stepped forward. Not even with a dollar. Oh my gosh! Well, yeah. you, you guys, uh, this is a great podcast. I mean, it's obviously one of oh, the. Yeah. Ones oh yeah. Oh. saying this. This could be the first podcast on your website of investing. You know, I'm just saying. That, just saying that, you you we'll could take be that under advisement. Please do. That's right. We could be. <laughs> Well, I was going to say we could be the Joe Rogans of Insure Tech podcast, but yeah. let's let's not do that. No, uh-uh. we don't want to overstate. No. We don't want to no. overstate ourselves. Well, you, uh, you do talk a lot about how the sausage is made, and that's what Joe Rogan does. So, I, yeah, it's a good analogy. We're, it's you know, it's got legs. We're we're, we're no legs. one on this podcast claims to be original. Absolutely, <laughs> um, we are always honored. And privilege to have you. It's a thrill. It's and and it's a thrill to a to highlight. have you at this point in your OBGYN <laughs> story. Thank you, and please come back again. And please think about 
naming your little girl, little Robbie. It's not common, <laughs> but you you skipped it on the first try. So That's I'm right. just, I'm putting my vote in. I like it. I like that you continue. You haven't let this go. That, that type of tenacity, you know, serves you well. The, I'm always so tickled right. when you guys ask me to come on this. So thank you again for having me. It's always such a delight and I love it. Well, great. It's great seeing you. Talk to you. Congratulations and good luck. Thank you very much. Caitlin Johnson. That's it. That's all I have to say. That's it. We're done. That's it. Well, I think uh, it's a pretty big name. Pretty big name. She's pretty amazing to talk to and a pretty amazing person. You know, we were just talking offline about likability. Mm -hmm. She's one of those people that is incredibly likable. And and it's because of her passion yeah. and her enthusiasm. She always has a smile. You can just hear the smile in her voice. Yeah. And she only gives us interviews when she's pregnant, nine months pregnant. That's right. So uh-huh. when's our next one based on maybe 18 to 24 yeah, months? Yeah, I think we have this one and then we have to wait a couple of years. So yeah. uh, that's okay, Caitlin. We'll wait for you. We'll it's wait for it. you. We'll wait for you. <laughs> Thank you, Caitlin Johnson, for being with us. Thank you, everybody, for being with us. And thank you for following us along. It's a privilege to do this podcast for our audience. So until next time. Goodbye, everybody.